Hello, everybody, and welcome to our webinar about the ECSS drafting rules. You will be muted during the webinar, but if you have any questions or comments, you can use the chat box. If you have any technical issues, please use the chat box or send an email to support at reusecompany.com. The webinar will be recorded, and in a few days, we will send you the link to the recording. My name is uh, Cecilia Carlson, and I will be hosting today's webinar uh, called ECSS Drafting Rules, the best way to write standards and other documents based on the ESA rules. This is the table of contents for the webinar. First, we will have a short presentation of the company and the presenter. After that, we will have a brief introduction to the ECSS. We will look at the ECSS drafting rules and the mapping of the rules uh, into a knowledge library. Then we will see some possible use cases and a demonstration. And after that, we will have some time for questions. But first, a few words about the reuse company. The reuse company was created in 1999 as a spin-off from a university in Madrid, Spain, by system and software engineers. Our headquarter is in Madrid but we also have an office in Stockholm, Sweden, and a delegation in uh, Tokyo, in Japan. In 2021, we are planning to open an office in the US. Our mission is to promote a reusable, scalable, and global solution to a smart and interoperable systems engineering environment. And we do this by offering a semantic knowledge-centric approach. Now let me introduce you to the presenter. Jose Fuentes is the Chief Operating Officer at the Reuse Company, and he has been the Product Manager of the Systems Engineering Suite Tools for more than five years. He has the INCOSA CSEP certification, and he has graduated in the INCOSA Institute for Technical Leadership. Jose is a member of the board of the Spanish chapter of INCOSA, and he's also an active contributor to the INCOSA Guide for Writing Requirements. So let's start then with today's topic. Jose, please tell us about the ECSS drafting rules. Uh, thank you, Cecilia. Uh, can you hear me well? Yes. Hey, great. Uh, so uh, welcome to this uh, session uh, I will, uh, where I will try to show you how um, we have implemented uh, the recommendations uh, uh, that are uh, described in the ECSS drafting rules into uh, one of our knowledge libraries what uh, makes uh, possible to uh, have automatic assessment uh, of uh, the requirements documents or uh, automatic assessment of the standards and handbooks that uh, you write according to, uh, to these rules. Uh, but uh, before I address this topic, before I address this topic, uh, sorry, I think I mute. Uh, <laughs> uh, before I address the topic, uh, let me just introduce the, um, the ECSS uh, itself. Uh, probably some of you already know ECSS uh, probably better than me, but uh, just a few words for those of you who still don't know uh, what is ECSS. Uh, and uh, it is the European Cooperation for Space Standardization. Uh, it was funded in 1996 uh, as an initiative established uh, to develop a coherent uh, single set of user-friendly standards for use in all European space activities. And thus, uh, providing an European space community with an integrity, with an integrated uh, set of space-specific standards. Right. So, if I am correct, uh, these uh, logos that you can see here is uh, the current um, uh, contributors to uh, to this ECSS. Uh, so, starting mainly with the uh, European Space Agency itself, but also the Italian, the uh, the uh, Italian uh, Space Agency, the one in the Netherlands, uh, uh, the French, uh, the Norwegian, the German, and the and the UK ones. Right. So these are the main contributors to to ECSS. Um, ECSS uh, has a, a, a issued a large number of uh, different standards, uh, starting with uh, with the glossary of terms, uh, just to have uh, uh, to synchronize uh, all of the actors. Uh, uh, collaborating in this uh, uh, aerospace industry in Europe but within the same uh, common uh, terminology, let's say. So this is uh, important also for us. That, uh, ECSS uh, gives uh, a lot of relevance to uh, and focus to this uh, to this document, and this is important for us. Remember that our approach is a knowledge-based approach, and the knowledge starts with uh, 
with uh, naming things in, in, a, in a common way. So uh, for us, it is uh, very important that ACSS uh, takes uh, this standard as, as the key one, just to uh, to, to lead uh, the way uh, things are named across the different standards. Then uh, together with this, uh, uh, you can see four different branches of standards, standards for project management, for product assurance, uh, for engineering, and for sustainability. Uh, it makes a large number of uh, standards and also a large number of uh, handbooks and, and other documents under these uh, four disciplines that you can see here in the, in the slide. So let me uh, just focus on, uh, on two uh, specific documents, um, which are the drafting rules. Uh, these drafting rules uh, are uh, elaborating a number of, uh, of recommendations on how to write uh, standards and how to write uh, handbooks. These are two different uh, uh, documents. We will see it in detail. And uh, I will also mention this uh, third uh, document. Uh, this is a little bit uh, different. This is not addressing the way uh, to uh, write uh, standards or write uh, templates uh, in the drafting rules, but now it is addressing the way to write down uh, technical requirement specifications. Uh, this document was addressed in one of our previous uh, webinars, so I will give you the link uh, to the recording of this uh, webinar. But uh, before that, let me focus on, on the drafting rules, which is, uh, uh, is today's topic. The first one is the drafting rules uh, for uh, and, and templates for ECSS standards. Uh, uh, it was issued, the latest version was issued in, uh, in the 1st of July this year. Um, uh, this is not an standard itself, but it was drafted uh, following the rules uh, that it is presenting. And the document tackles uh, aspects uh, like, uh, of course, uh, terms and definition, like every uh, single uh, ECSS document, and principles on how to structure and organize uh, the standards. Uh, also, some requirements on how to write uh, these standards and uh, some few annexes that uh, one of them uh, will be, uh, I will uh, uh, mention this uh, in a minute. So, mainly the, the kind of rules that you can find in this um, uh, drafting rule uh, document are uh, rules on how to uh, or, or what uh, tenses uh, and verbal uh, uh, forms uh, to, uh, are welcome in this kind of uh, standards. What is the structure of an individual normative uh, clause or requirement? Uh, how to name references, uh, both internal references, but also external references? Uh, how to uh, identify when uh, the numbers, especially in decimal numbers that uh, you are using in your uh, documents are well, well written according to these rules? Or how to deal with uh, units uh, always in the decimal system and always uh, um, uh, units uh, following numbers and never numbers uh, alone. Let's say how to write uh, properly write uh, tolerances. What is the proper format for the tolerance uh, or the formats in plural? Because there are several options. Or, or how to control the the values that. Uh, you provide to these uh, tolerances, uh, avoiding uh, vague and not verifiable concepts or subjective uh, clauses. So all these are the typical recommendations that uh, you will find in, in this uh, drafting rules uh, document. Um, important to mention that uh, in order to address uh, uh, some of these recommendations, uh, uh, you will be needing a kind of a smart uh, parsing uh, mechanism. Uh, so it is not uh, as simple as just uh, detecting uh, keywords or, or having just a kind of a keyword spotter just to look for these kind of keywords. Some uh, uh, some uh, of these recommendations, like the one that I have highlighted here, but you can find uh, uh, many different examples on, on this, uh, it could be a little bit contradictory unless uh, you apply some some uh, smart uh, uh, or uh, tools or artificial intelligence, let's say. So, for instance. Uh, uh, this is one of the characteristics uh, taken from uh, from the uh, drafting rules itself, uh, forcing us or, or moving us uh, somehow to, to write uh, um, uh, concise requirements. And uh, to me, one of the uh, main sources of non-concise requirements is when you use parentheses just to add additional information within the parentheses. So, so normally brackets are not welcome in in in, a, in this kind of, of uh, standards or, or technical specifications. However, we have uh, some other rules. This is a different rule that is uh, uh, um, moving us or is somehow forcing us to use parentheses just to uh, to to refer to to the different annexes in in a, in, a, um, uh, in a reference, right? So one rule is is telling us not to use parentheses. The other one is tell, is telling us to use parentheses. So the idea is that, uh, as you can see here, uh, the only way to deal with this uh, kind of uh, contradiction is by applying a smart uh, uh, parsing tools. And this is what uh, I I'm going to show you today in the live uh, during the live demo, right? So this is uh, fully needed. Uh, the 
this kind of smart uh, parsing, right? Uh, more about uh, this uh, drafting rules uh, document. It is also describing what is what should be the template uh, for a well-formed uh, ECSS standard. So this is uh, the template uh, that is uh, recommended uh, in this uh, in this document. And uh, uh, now this is uh, this uh, this uh, logical flow was just introduced uh, in the latest version uh, the, this year, first uh, of July. Uh, is uh, is a kind of uh, logical flow on how to deal with uh, terminology uh, and uh, the uh, the references of this terminology in both in the ECSS glossary and also in the terminology section of the different documents. So this. Uh, uh, flow has been partially uh, implemented uh, in our tool, as uh, as I will mention, uh, as I will show during the uh, the live demo, only partially. So the second of the drafting rules uh, documents um, is uh, pretty much uh, similar to the previous one, uh, but uh, this one is is now addressing not how to uh, draft uh, uh, ECSS standards, but uh, how to draft uh, ECSS handbooks. Uh, we can say that um, uh, the recommendations are, are pretty much uh, similar. Uh, in fact, uh, it is a kind of a subset uh, of the of the previous document, uh, uh, with some uh, changes, of course. Uh, while uh, standards are more, let's say, uh, normative. Um, uh, in, in a handbook, uh, uh, a shall clause, for instance, uh, is to be forbidden, right? Uh, so this is one of the main. Uh, differences, how to uh, understand a standard and how to understand a, a handbook in, in this uh, in this sense. And then, of course, uh, you will find what is the recommended structure for a, for a handbook, uh, which is uh, the one that uh, you can see. So these are the, the two uh, documents uh, I will be focusing today. Uh, I also mentioned uh, uh, yet a third uh, document. Uh, this is the ECSS EST 10 OCC. Uh, uh, which is uh, more is not uh, addressing the way to write uh, um, uh, standards or, or handbooks. It is uh, it is addressing the the requirements uh, um, specification itself, uh, including a process on how to 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 manage requirements, uh, including also um, uh, uh, taxonomy of different types of requirements, and including some uh, rules on how to write requirements. Um, uh, this uh, this is the the, um, the catalog of rules uh, uh, that uh, is described in the uh, in this standard, including uh, among others, including the typical and classical ambiguity, uniqueness, identifiability, singularity, completeness, verifiability, uh, and uh, and also some other uh, attributes for the requirements. Uh, also addressing the idea of the format of the document and uh, and the format of the requirement uh, itself. Uh, the verbal form uh, to be used, uh, some restrictions on how to write requirements. So all this is what uh, you can find uh, within this uh, within this uh, uh, document. Uh, uh, however, one of the um, uh, weak points that uh, I find in this document is that uh, the definition for some of these uh, quality characteristics is rather uh, vague. Let's say. Uh, uh, so, if uh, when you go down uh, to to the section that uh, describes uh, what ambiguity means, then you find that the only description is a technical requirement shall be ambiguous. So it's uh, almost nothing. Let's say uh, the same for uniqueness; its uh, technical requirements shall be unique. So this is the uh, the only definition for these quality characteristics that you can find in the in the standard. So uh, our solution uh, was to. Uh, uh, kind of uh, take uh, the recommendation from the INCOSE guide for writing requirements. Uh, this uh, recommendation has been uh, implemented, as uh, some of you already know, in, in one of our libraries. And that uh, the metrics that we have implemented uh, in this library that are addressing ambiguity or uniqueness uh, are now also part of the, of the library that uh, is uh, presented today. So it is a kind of uh, uh, merging together of uh, both worlds, uh, uh, ECSS and INCOSE, but uh, uh, having uh, ECSS as the reference for, for classification of these uh, uh, quality characteristics. In any case, uh, as, uh, as is uh, uh, following the, the um, title of this uh, webinar, I will be focusing today on the drafting rules and not on this other document, because this document was presented in one of my webinars a couple of years ago. So if you want uh, to know more about uh, this, uh, uh, this uh, document and uh, the way we have implemented uh, the rules in this document, uh, here you can find a link. Uh, you will have a copy of these slides. And uh, this is a link uh, to uh, watch uh, the webinar. This webinar is available on our website. Uh, if you don't uh, have the link, 
just go to resources and webinars and then you can uh, scroll down to the all the webinars and uh, you will find uh, this webinar, right so let me focus on uh, on the way we have implemented uh, the um, the drafting rules and uh, and uh, this is uh, uh, under the form of a knowledge library so first uh, let me explain you what is a knowledge library and uh, what is uh, an ontology itself in our approach so this uh, colored uh, shape uh, is uh, is a definition that we use for an ontology uh, probably uh, you can find uh, lots of different uh, definitions for what an ontology is uh, and uh, uh, we are not claiming that uh, this is the best definition ever for an ontology, but uh, at least uh, we do think that uh, this is the definition that uh, better uh, matches with uh, our approach of uh, analy analyzing textual documents. This is why everything starts with uh, the first layer, which is the uh, control vocabulary or glossary. Uh, this is uh, fully mapping uh, with the definition that I was mentioning of uh, ECSS, starting with the ECSS glossary. So in our approach, what we have done is we have mapped uh, uh, the the ECSS glossary in in this uh, first layer of this library. library. Then in, in second in the second layer, um, uh, we uh, humans and also computers we both we don't like when things are isolated. We prefer when things are linked together or classified together somehow. So in the second layer, uh, this is what uh, we address. We are addressing the idea of uh, classifying together uh, the concepts uh, from the previous layer either uh, classification by meaning, so similar concepts uh, could be uh, grouped together, uh, especially for the axioms, or classification by the nature of the term where we can group together, okay, this and this and this could be actors, while this and this and this could be uh, systems or, or segments or whatever, right? I will give you an example in the following slide. And then the third, uh, the third pattern is uh, something that uh, distinguishes us uh, from uh, other uh, ontology approaches, which is uh, uh, our intention is to recognize uh, natural language uh, statements. So we need some sort of uh, grammar or definition of a grammar for a well-formed requirement and also for not so well-formed requirements as well. Of course, uh, just to identify that it is not uh, well-formed, right? So this uh, kind of grammars is what in our approach we call patterns as a sequence of um, of uh, the different blocks uh, conforming a well-formed requirement, as I said. Uh, then in, in, uh, in layer four is when uh, we try to transform uh, from a natural language, uh, could be English, uh, Spanish, Italian, uh, French, uh, German, so any of the uh, eight languages that uh, we are uh, providing so far, uh, into something that is more uh, machine oriented. And this machine oriented is, is, uh, is a semantic graph. So this is what uh, we use in, for our formalization. Uh, so that the fifth uh, uh, layer is the reasoning, which is when the magic happens. Uh, we have different tools for different purposes, like uh, uh, tools for searching for similar information or uh, traceability or also quality. So in our in this case, we are focused on quality. So the reasoning uh, will be applying some sort of algorithm. It could be artificial intelligence or not, uh, just to identify when a requirement is not fully uh, following the rules. So this is uh, a brief uh, and probably a little bit stupid example uh, following these uh, five layers uh, in, the, in the space domain. Um, so the first layer is the vocabulary. Uh, if you can see, by the way, I can I can draw this uh, vertical line because uh, uh, whatever what is uh, to the right of this uh, uh, vertical line is what we call common English. And this is normally uh, what you can find in every of our uh, databases. When you take one of our databases, one of our ontologies out of the box, then you will find uh, concepts like uh, system, operate, temperature, environment, pressure, and also these uh, uh, little words, uh, words like uh, shall, the, so, uh, so modal verbs, uh, prepositions, determiners, so all this is part of uh, any of our uh, databases or ontologies out of the box. Uh, however, um, uh, some of our uh, customers, or mo most of our customers, uh, they want to take the most of the tool and that they will take the most uh, when they are capable of providing some sort of domain specific information. Um, in some uh, cases, uh, this domain specific information has to be provided by you. You have to populate uh, your own uh, dictionaries and ontologies. But the good news, uh, when we deploy this kind of uh, libraries like the ECSS library, is that the library itself, it already includes uh, uh, some of this information, let's say, just by uh, importing this library. Uh, of course, uh, the, uh, with regards to this first layer of vocabulary, in, in the case of ECSS, we have implemented uh, the, the common glossary that is described in the standard that I was uh, mentioning some slides uh, ago. 
Uh, but this is not meaning that uh, every single term for all the different disciplines will be there. So probably you will have to populate uh, information from uh, from these different disciplines. But uh, during our during my live demo, I will try to to show you how to automatize this process of extracting um, uh, the common concepts that appear in in, every, in 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 one of these or, or or in the different disciplines that you address, right? So in this uh, particular example, I just uh, describe a shuttle, a space shuttle, and uh, some other concepts like uh, Discovery or, or, or Columbia. Uh, so that in the second layer is where, as I mentioned, we group or link things together. Uh, we say that temperature and pressure are both environmental variables. Uh, this yellow bubble is meaning that uh, to operate and to work are having a similar meaning and are actions uh, both. Uh, in here, you can see like the shuttle is a kind of uh, system. And Columbia is a kind of uh, is, a, is an instance of, of a shuttle. Uh, however, if you can distinguish the uh, end of the arrow, this is a diamond and this is a triangle. So this is meaning an is a relationship, while this is meaning a kind of a part uh, whole part relationship. So uh, a shuttle is made up of uh, fuselage, uh, wing, landing gear, and so on and so forth. Right. So this is the way we are linking things together, including also restrictions like the restriction of temperature that you can find here. Temperature in, in our uh, uh, system, according to this example, uh, has to be between 260 below to uh, 1,600, right? So um, uh, this is a pattern uh, conform of uh, blocks like uh, system name. This is the subject of my requirement, a typical shall, uh, uh, an action, verb, and then minimum and then environmental variable that uh, according to the previous layer could be either temperature or pressure, and then of a number and, and as an, uh, an measurement unit at the end, right? So that uh, when we have uh, in the fourth layer of the formalization, when we take an actual requirement like uh, this one, the Columbia shall be able to operate at a minimum temperature of uh, 10 uh, Kelvin, uh, we, can, we can transform this text into a semantic graph Part of this semantic graph uh, is uh, is uh, addressing kind of the, the restriction that uh, you can find here. So it is uh, uh, getting a similar uh, a similar uh, structure, right? Uh, so the the temperature of this actual requirement. Uh, of course, the tool uh, our tool can translate uh, this uh, uh, temperature from Kelvin to to centigrade, right? Uh, so telling us that the this requirement is meaning that the temperature has to be 263 uh, below. Celsius, so that in the reasoning we can compare the restriction on here with the information from the requirement, just to say that something is wrong in this requirement because the temperature is not fitting within the limits, right? So this is uh, an example. I, I hope uh, you can uh, you can you have uh, followed this example. This is an example of, of uh, consistency between uh, requirements and uh, and models, right? Of course, uh, most of the rules uh, that uh, are addressed in this drafting rule are not uh, that far are, are far uh, easier, like. Uh, uh, using the proper modal verb or, or using concise requirements and so on and so forth, where there is no need uh, to have the many specific information. However, um, uh, for those of you that uh, who want to take the most of our tools, uh, this consistency normally is, is the way you, you take the most of the tool, right? So, um, once that you know what is uh, a knowledge library, uh, for, uh, sorry, uh, um, um, an ontology for us, uh, just a knowledge library is is a combination of uh, all these uh, aspects. Uh, so we have uh, we have uh, taken different uh, standards uh, to, from from ECSS to conform uh, uh, these uh, five layers, and this is what is offered. Uh, so that uh, you don't have to populate uh, this information yourself. You just uh, go to our web, uh, website, download the library, import the library in our tool knowledge manager, and that's all, right? So this is a knowledge library. So in this case, the knowledge library, as I mentioned, uh, includes uh, the information from the glossary, as you can see here. So the list of uh, terms from the ECSS standards uh, and uh, the definition for each of these terms and the sources in which specific standard uh, uh, this uh, this concept, this particular concept, is uh, is used, right? So this is the first layer. Um, then in the second layer, we have provided some sort of uh, taxonomy structure to some of the concepts that we found in the previous layer, right? So this is uh, layer two, and also we have uh, uh, classified uh, these uh, these um, uh, concepts under different uh, clusters. The first cluster is uh, what is the discipline where uh, this, uh, this, uh, each specific term uh, has to be used, but also we have uh, created clusters uh, to identify uh, segments or to identify system elements and so on and so forth, right? So this is what uh, you will find in the second layer. 
Uh, then in the third layer, we have implemented a taxonomy of different types of requirements. Uh, in this case, this taxonomy is not coming from the drafting rules document, but uh, it is coming from this other document that I was mentioning before, right? Uh, so these are the different types of, uh, of requirements that are recommended uh, in this standard. So functional, mission requirements, interface requirements, environmental, operational, and so on and so forth. Then um, uh, we have implemented a number of patterns. These patterns uh, uh, norm are normally used to help uh, people while uh, they are actually writing requirements. Uh, we, but uh, we can also use patterns to parse uh, uh, textual uh, and unstructured documents, or we can use patterns to generate automatic, uh, automatically uh, models uh, out, of, uh, out of requirements, like uh, generating CCML models or generating ORM, object role, uh, role model as well. Um, uh, this is uh, kind of this is one example of uh, of a pattern. So uh, if uh, if you follow the interface requirement as is described in this standard uh, that I was mentioning here, this one, uh, then the structure is an entity, is the subject, then a modal verb, uh, then a communication verb. It cannot be any single verb in our in our dictionary. It has to be a verb under the cluster or within the cluster of uh, communication. Then another entity. So this entity is uh, uh, communicate with uh, this other entity with uh, uh, something else uh, that could be a kind of constraint, or this could be the entity that is uh, communicated from uh, from this one to this one, right? So uh, this is just uh, one example of this kind of uh, of uh, requirement. Uh, the product shall dialogue uh, with the ground segment uh, using telemetry. So this is an example fully fitting into into this uh, this pattern, right? And uh, uh, of course, this is the pattern now that it is implemented in in um, in Notes Manager, where you can see in red all the different ent uh, blocks like entity or model block, uh, the main verb, which has to be a communication verb, as I mentioned. Then some optional elements like prepositions and so on. Then uh, the sender, the receiver of the communication, and then the parameter of the communication, like the last entity here, right? So uh, uh, this was the, the fourth uh, layer, and then the fifth layer, uh, the quality rules. Um, and when you uh, implement uh, this uh, library that is uh, presented today, uh, you will find uh, these uh, uh, three uh, possible set of rules, uh, two for the uh, two drafting rules and one for the uh, technical requirement specification, the ECSS uh, EST 1006, right? Uh, so this is what you will find in the database uh, so that when you double click one of these, and then you will see all the different rules that are included in, in, in each of the different uh, set of rules, right? So I have just uh, double click on the handbook uh, uh, drafting rule for, for handbooks. And you, then you will find that, uh, as I mentioned, this is the smallest uh, one uh, only containing 16 uh, quality rules, like the verbal structure, avoid this or that, invalid references, and, and so on and so forth. So this is uh, what you have, uh, uh, let's say, uh, just when you import uh, your, your life, right? So, uh, with this library, what uh, can we do? What are the proposed uh, use cases that uh, can be addressed uh, once you have imported this library? So, before I address these uh, use cases, let me introduce you the um, uh, systems engineering suite uh, in version 18.4. Uh, 18 this 18.4 was released uh, a month ago. So, probably for some of you, uh, some of these boxes are, are new uh, kits, uh, let's say, in the, in the neighborhood. But uh, I will just focus on, on the, on the well-known RQA, RAT, and KM. This is the key focus of, uh, of uh, this library. So RQA is, is a tool capable of uh, connecting to external requirements repositories. According to uh, the ECSS standard, uh, uh, the tool for drafting uh, both standards and, uh, and uh, handbooks uh, has to be a Microsoft Word. So uh, RQA can connect uh, can parse uh, a Microsoft Word document, a structure requirements, so that you can check the quality of these requirements, as you will see in the in the demo. Uh, or you can uh, you can use the authoring tool, as I was mentioning in a minute, uh, just to write requirements uh, on it. Right? We can also con uh, interface with the Excel and Integrity or IBM DOS, which is another tool recommended by ECSS. Right? So, uh, so once you import uh, the library that I was uh, presenting today. Uh, you can access to, to this uh, three uh, set of rules uh, in, in RQA, and you can assign any of these uh, three uh, set of rules to any of your different documents. This is RQA. Of course, you can open the document in RQA, and you can um, analyze the quality of this document according to the set of rules that you have selected. 
So this is the first uh, use case. The second one is uh, when it comes to uh, not uh, to the inspection, but uh, rather to the uh, to the uh, uh, creation or ed uh, uh, or when you are editing your requirements for the first time. Uh, so this is why uh, we have implemented uh, the RAT uh, tool, the the rich authoring tool. Uh, you can see like the logo is a little bit different, and now I have uh, used the logo of the of the tool, but also a small uh, uh, RAT box. This is meaning that unlike the previous one, the RAT is an add-on on top of your tool, right? So while RQA is an external tool, external to Word or external to Doors, uh, the RAT tool is an add-on on top of uh, Word or on top of Doors, uh, as well as uh, other tools, so that uh, you can have real-time quality assessment and real-time uh, help uh, with, the, with a set of patterns that uh, you define in KM. So when you import uh, uh, this uh, ECSS library, then you will have uh, uh, all the quality rules, as I mentioned, but you will have all the uh, vocabulary as coming from the ECSS uh, uh, glossary standard. Uh, you will have uh, all the patterns that I was describing before. So you will have everything ready uh, for you to, to write your requirements uh, in, uh, uh, in Word, let's say, uh, following the rules and recommendations that are coming from RQA and following the patterns that uh, you have described in in, um, in KM and uh, using uh, the elements from the vocabulary that can be uh, either coming from the um, uh, from the ECSS glossary or uh, you can also connect uh, KM to external reference to external uh, modeling tools like uh, Rhapsody, Capella, MATLAB, Simulink, uh, Magic Group, Cameo, uh, or, or even ontologies in Protege, so that the vocabulary uh, can uh, come from from these sources as well. Right. So considering this. Um, in this environment, uh, the number of uh, use cases that uh, uh, are feasible with uh, the SES suite and uh, together with the library is real-time checking of the drafting rules on, uh, on Microsoft Word on top of uh, using the RAT plugin, pattern-based uh, authoring of, uh, on, on top of uh, Word as well, this is the RAT plugin as well, uh, suggestion mechanism uh, uh, so that uh, new concepts that uh, you find when uh, writing requirements in in, in RAT can be suggested to, uh, to the knowledge library. Uh, this is a combination, let's say, of the three tools that you can see here. The inspection of a document, uh, including reporting based on the drafting rules. This is uh, RQA now. Uh, automatic extraction of new vocabulary from existing specifications or standards or handbooks uh, is also RQA in collaboration with the knowledge manager. Uh, requirements extraction from unstructured sources. Uh, it is the RAT uh, tool. Um, uh, document inspections on doors or, or even authoring on doors. So this is uh, also possible uh, with uh, RAT uh, and, uh, and RQA and also traceability. Uh, I will not focus uh, uh, today on, on this tool, but also the traceability with, that is uh, suggested by, uh, by the ECSS. Uh, ECSS can be also managed by our uh, tool, Traceability Studio. Probably this tool is a little bit uh, a new tool for some of you. Uh, but uh, there is, uh, we have uh, already presented a webinar on this topic, so just uh, browse our website and uh, and uh, look up uh, for for this Traceability um, uh, Studio webinar if you want uh, to know more about about it. Right. So the main conclusions is that um, uh, we have implemented uh, successfully, I believe, successfully implemented uh, these uh, five layers uh, of the ontology into a knowledge uh, library. Uh, this library is already available. Just uh, follow this link uh, uh, and uh, you will find it uh, there. Uh, um, uh, as soon as the recording of, of this webinar is, is ready, we will send you an email uh, to let you know, including the uh, copy of the slides and also including uh, the link uh, to download the library. And uh, 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 the SES suite uh, now covers uh, all these uh, uh, use cases described in, this, in the previous slide. So what is not uh, fully uh, done, what is, uh, let's say, pending somehow, is um, the way to analyze the structure of the documents. Uh, now with our Collective Studio tool, we can uh, have rules uh, uh, to analyze uh, the overall structure of a document, but, if they, but uh, this kind of rules uh, has not been implemented uh, in, this in this library. It could be, it, it would be, by the way, implemented in, in the next uh, versions of the library, but not in this one. So I put it in the pending uh, section. Um, this uh, uh, this will not only uh, analyze uh, that the structure is uh, according to the to this uh, uh, picture, uh, let's say, but also some other rules like a detection of normative that uh, cannot be beyond the level five 
or detection of uh, footnotes or detection of, uh, of, of the normative annexes that uh, shall always precede any other annex and ha has to be followed by uh, informative annexes. So this kind of, of rules are not implemented in the current version of the library, but they will be uh, implemented in, in the coming versions, right? Uh, also, uh, all the rules on, on how to uh, identify or how to uh, establish uh, uh, when the ID of the requirement uh, is well formed or if it is unique or not. So all this is not uh, addressed in this version, but it will be very soon, as well as uh, some uh, restrictions on how to write notes or how to write uh, captions for tables or captions for figures in, in, your, in your document. So all this uh, is in, in the section of pending. As well as the full implementation of uh, of this uh, flow that I was mentioning before, uh, the flow to uh, to determine uh, how to uh, deal with uh, new concepts uh, uh, in your documents if they have to be just in the in the terminology section of this document or if they have to be moved uh, into the uh, the common uh, glossary of of ECSS. All this is partially implemented, as you will see in a minute, but uh, some additional. Um, uh, work has to be done just to have the full implementation of this uh, flow, right? So, uh, now I hope that uh, these uh, slides uh, were enough uh, for you uh, as to know a little bit uh, more about uh, the, uh, our approach, our tools, and uh, what we have done with regards to the um, uh, ECSS standards. Now, let me uh, open uh, a video just to, to show you uh, this uh, implementation. So, this is now the video. Uh, and now this is um, yeah, this is a, a document, a space engineering, systems engineering, general requ requirements. So this is the standard which is uh, telling us how to do systems engineering according to the ECSS. And uh, uh, this version is this is a, just a word uh, a word document with uh, different sections here and there. So these are the the, the risk related uh, uh, section. And uh, I don't know if you can see on the top, uh, there's a, a menu called RAT. Uh, so when you install the RAT plugin on top of uh, Word, uh, this is what uh, you will find, including the, the, the button to open the RAT uh, screen itself. So this is the RAT, the offering screen. Uh, let me disable, uh, for the moment, let me disable the, the way of writing using patterns. So let me now have uh, free typing, because of course, uh, uh, even if you use the RAT tool, you can have free typing. Uh, however, free typing sometimes is prone to, to errors, right? So I start uh, typing my writing my requirement. The system the infection is normally tracked. So I, I'm, I'm making some mistakes uh, just due to the fact that uh, this is the normal way probably we, we normal, uh, normally write. However, this is against the drafting rules uh, for standards, right? So clearly the tool can identify that I have been using passive voice or I have been using normally, which is uh, not welcome. It's a vague uh, uh, adverb and uh, normally not uh, welcome in our requirements. And of course, this requirement is not uh, uh, is not uh, using a typical shall. So the shall is missing or any other normative uh, verb is missing. So let me now remove uh, all this um, and take, uh, as you can see, the, all this checking is real time. And now let me write the following pattern. Let me show you the difference. So I have picked this functional pattern. I can see what is the structure of this uh, functional requirement uh, pattern. I can see the description, the, some examples of all the requirements following this, uh, this uh, structure. And now I can start typing. Uh, what you will see is that, um, of course, when I enable the, the term suggestion, if I enable the writing assistance with the term suggestion, right? Now you can see a kind of a drop down list, which is including all the elements from the dictionary that are fitting into this block. So now uh, I have to write uh, uh, um, the, the, the first meaningful block uh, is, is a function or, or is a component. So I have picked the system function from the list. Then now the tool offers to me can, may, shall, should. It is not offering the other kind of uh, modal verbs, uh, so only the modal verbs that are allowed in this uh, in this uh, kind of um, of standard. So the shall track. So all these verbs are coming from the dictionary. And now the word risk is also coming from the dictionary. If when I press the R key, then I find risk or requirement. But I I write uh, shall track risks. You can see a green frame. Uh, telling me, okay, this requirement is now according to the structure, but I keep uh, uh, typing some additional blocks like in accordance with, and now I will mention uh, an ECSS standard, right? 
So, but in this case, uh, I, am maybe, uh, I am making up uh, this standard. So this is not a valid standard. I just invented uh, this, this name. So the tool is, is uh, checking this name against the list of uh, possible names. And it is telling me that it seems the structure seems to be okay for an ECSS uh, uh, document, but it is not in the list. So let me now change and select the one that uh, hopefully it is in the list. So in this case, it's the ECSS M. Uh, 0003B. And the tool is, is now telling me that this is in the list, but it is in the list of uh, superseded uh, standards, right? So I can just uh, by clicking there, I can see what is the scope node, risk management. Uh, okay, so I know that what is the topic, but uh, I can see that it is superseded and replaced by ECSS MST uh, ATC. So now I have uh, all the uh, clues needed just to just to change uh, this uh, and uh, provide the latest version of the uh, of the standard related with the risk management uh, in the ECSS, which is uh, ATC. Now, when I write ATC, I still have a, a message uh, uh, telling me that um, uh, I should be adding uh, a specific section of this document. Uh, so normally, uh, uh, an external reference has to be coming together with uh, with something just to contextualize. Uh, something like a section six, right? So now when I write uh, all this, then is when I have no issues in this table. So everything is green and no issues. So I can just uh, save and close. And uh, since I was on top of Word, then my requirement is there. So I don't have to move information from one tool to the other. The requirement is there. So this was the first uh, use case, how to uh, write uh, requirements in, in Word uh, following uh, uh, the recommendations from the drafting rules and following patterns. Now the second, uh, the following uh, use case is uh, is how to use RQA to analyze a complete uh, document. Uh, this is RQA, uh, the other tool that I was mentioning. Uh, RQA can connect to Word, to Excel, to DOORS, to many other types of uh, of repositories. Now I'm connecting to this uh, to this um, uh, Word document. The tool is asking me, okay, which uh, which uh, set of rules uh, do you want to apply? So I will click uh, yes, and I will pick uh, the, um, uh, the drafting rules for standards because this is an standard. So these are the three uh, set of rules that I was uh, introducing in my slides. So now I click on the drafting rule for standards. The tool is now uh, parsing. Uh, uh, remember that this is a Word document, so we must uh, parse and we are extracting a lot of different uh, paragraphs and sections and here and there, but uh, I will just uh, hide uh, so that uh, we can focus on the requirements in section five. So this was my parsing uh, procedure was just to focus on, on these requirements. And now I will have the overall uh, checking uh, of the quality of these uh, of uh, all these requirements according to the uh, drafting rules for 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 standards. Uh, this is real time, so the analysis is is pretty quick. So now uh, this is a small document, by the way, only 85 requirements. And now I have the I have the the quality analysis. So in these uh, columns that uh, you can find here with the one, two, three stars is where we determine the level of quality of this uh, of this uh, requirement. I will not uh, uh, focus today on on the different features of uh, of the tool. We have plenty of other um, uh, webinars describing the features of the tool. But uh, of course, the tool can can tell us what is the level of quality. Uh, by the way, the level of quality of this document uh, probably is not was, what uh, was expected, uh, so it is uh, very bad uh, quality according to this. However, uh, this is due to the fact that uh, uh, there is no specific vocabulary for this standard into the into our knowledge base, right? So this is what uh, what is making that the formulation of a requirement uh, rule uh, is uh, is is uh, broken in ninety two percent or almost ninety three percent of uh, of my requirements, right? Almost in every requirement is, is breaking this rule. Yes, due to the fact that the subject of these uh, of these uh, requirements, uh, the subject is part of the glossary, but it is not uh, uh, part of the uh, entities or agents uh, cluster, which is uh, what is conforming uh, a well formed requirement. A well formed requirement has to start with an agent and then a shop, right? Uh, I, I will address this topic in a minute. Then, uh, other uh, uh, it is also important to mention that uh, uh, this is, uh, as I mentioned, this is not a mistake. This is just uh, uh, due to the fact that uh, some information has to be added to the ontology. I will address this uh, now. But uh, there, uh, despite of this, uh, there are other uh, uh, clear mistakes in the document. 
So like uh, uh, some of the standards that are uh, mentioned in this document are not uh, uh, active standards today, right? So this is an active standard, but uh, they are not uh, pointing to us uh, active standards. So we have found eight uh, mistakes, eight of these mistakes in this document. So references to this ECSS EST10, which is not a, a valid name anymore. The, uh, this document is ECSS or should be ECSS EST 10 c So this is the latest version of this of this standard, right? So this is why the tool is complaining and flagging uh, uh, this requirement uh, as uh, not um, uh, not a good requirement. Also, uh, the use of uh, active voice or passive voice in this case, detection of passive voice. This is not uh, a mandatory rule. By the way, uh, according to the drafting rule, is just a recommendation. In case you can, please use uh, use uh, uh, active voice uh, rather than passive voice. So uh, with our tool, you can uh, you can change uh, the weight. Of course, you can disable this rule. Uh, I decided to implement uh, the rule and to keep the rule. But if you want, uh, you can disable this rule, or uh, you can have this rule with less uh, weight than the rest of the rules. Because as I mentioned, it is just a recommendation. It is not uh, to be uh, followed for every single requirement, right? So all this is possible with our tool. And uh, we have uh, plenty of other uh, webinars where we explain you how to change the weight of a rule or how to disable a rule and so on. So uh, also, there are some few um, uh, pronouns in the um, in the in the specification that normally uh, pronounce uh, lead to ambiguity. So this is why these pronouns are detected. Or the use of uh, example gratia, which is uh, normally is to be uh, avoided, but uh, in this particular document. Uh, um, a lot of requirements are, are providing an example within brackets that uh, normally I don't like this uh, this uh, way of writing, right? So all this is uh, what uh, can be detected uh, uh, along with uh, many other uh, findings and, and rules uh, in, in the tool. Uh, I go back to the main tool just to show you the, the reporting mechanism uh, where uh, you can uh, uh, create uh, quickly uh, uh, and uh, a PDF report or a Word report, an Excel report, uh, including the main uh, findings of, uh, of this document. So this is my report with a chart and also with a table. The, in this other chart, uh, you, can, you can find uh, those metrics in red uh, with the red bar uh, are the, more, the, the most challenging uh, metrics, uh, the formulation of the requirement, as I was mentioning. Uh, however, when you move, uh, scroll down, then you can see a lot, of, a lot of metrics with just a green bar, which is meaning that uh, this metric is not uh, detected in, the, in, in, the, in this document. It's not affecting the document, this one, right? So this is, uh, this is RQA. I move a little bit further just to open one specific requirement uh, and to show you the the uh, issue that I was mentioning before of the subject of the of the requirements, right? So the tool is telling me that uh, this requirement is not uh, well formulated because uh, RJF uh, is, uh, even if it is part of the dictionary, it is not uh, in the cluster of uh, possible agents, right? As, uh, as I will try to show you in a, in a minute. But uh, before I, I show that, uh, I also want, want you to know or to, to, to be aware of this AND uh, connector. Uh, normally, connectors are not welcome in, in a requirement, but uh, since in this case it is part of this structure between A and B, let's say, then uh, we have some exceptions in the tool to say, okay, if the connector is coming in the condition or if it is coming in a clause like between A and B, then it is it, it doesn't have to be highlighted. This is what we have done in this case, right? But now, uh, as I said, let me focus on, on the subject. The subject is uh, you can just move the mouse over the, the concept and the tool will tell you, okay, this is the scope note of uh, what is uh, RJF meaning. And uh, you, we can see that R RJF is part of the ontology, but it is not part of the cluster that uh, is normally used uh, for the subject of the requirement. So I just uh, I have just uh, right click and I am sending a suggestion for the people in charge of managing the, the glossaries and the dictionary. So the suggestion is now sent. And now let me uh, change uh, the tool and uh, let me open uh, KM. I am now opening KM. The knowledge manager tool. So this is KM. I connect uh, to the same uh, database, and then I can see like uh, there is a new suggestion, a suggestion created by me uh, on the concept uh, RJF. 
And uh, uh, if I double click, I can see the details and whatever. And suppose that I accept. Okay, I, I agree with this suggestion. So I will move uh, RJF uh, to the cluster that uh, this other guy, myself in this case, uh, is suggesting. So I just uh, right click and add uh, uh, RJF to the cluster of agents. Click OK. Now it is part of the cluster of agents. Uh, I save the database. And uh, this uh, change is not, uh, let's say, uh, in real time. I have to reload uh, the, uh, the ontology if I want uh, this change uh, to, uh, to, be, to be made. But before I do uh, so, let me show you another means of extracting vocabulary in a quick way from, from the document. And this is, uh, I was mentioning, three set of uh, three combination of rules, but uh, I have included in this case uh, yet a fourth uh, uh, set of rules. This set of rule is not uh, to, to check if my document is, is following the drafting rules, but it is just uh, pre it is prepared uh, to extract automatically uh, the, the subjects of the requirements or the actions of the requirements. I made it uh, very easy in this case, just uh, to, with uh, two metrics, one to extract the subject and one to extract uh, the um, the the actions right so if you want to know what are the subject of, of your requirements then you just uh, execute uh, this uh, set of rules and these two rules and then you find that uh, uh, ddf is used uh, 13 times uh, djf is used 11 times pum is seven times uh, sep is uh, seven times uh, system engineering function is seven times as well so this is a, a very quick way to extract uh, uh, what is what, uh, what is the subject of the of the requirements even if these subjects are not uh, uh, in the cluster of agents so this is a quick way to suggest a new content for the cluster of agent and uh, in those cases where there's, there could be some verbs that are not in the cluster of actions then we can see like uh, contain uh, is, is the verb that appears in 24 uh, of, of my requirements and so on so that uh, you can quickly move all these to the km and then you can uh, just reload uh, the RQA uh, ontology. This is what I am doing now. So this is uh, again RQA. But now uh, I have to just now there is uh, there are some changes in the in the ontology. One of the changes is that uh, RJF is now uh, part of the agent uh, cluster. So that when I open my requirement, what you can see here is that uh, the the quality is high and uh, the recommendation uh, or, or the metric uh, telling me that uh, this is this recommendation was not well formed. Now it is over due to the fact that now uh, RJF is, is now part of the agent uh, cluster. So this uh, requirement is, is well written, let's say, right? So let me move a little bit uh, forward uh, to, to show you some other uh, use cases. Now I will, uh, uh, this is uh, now the RAT tool, uh, just to uh, show you how uh, RAT can parse uh, uh, a document, even if it is not following the structure of the ECSS. So just in this example, I will try to parse uh, a document which is not uh, uh, ECSS document. It is uh, a uh, NASA or Jet Propulsion Lab uh, document uh, uh, describing some mission requirements for, for the James Webb uh, uh, Space Telescope. So let me uh, open uh, this document for you. So this is the document that I was mentioning. Uh, as I said, uh, uh, it is not. Uh, it is uh, clearly not uh, uh, um, an ECCS document. So the structure is different. It's a little bit different. And this is uh, uh, preventing uh, this library to have the ability to parse uh, this document, to parse the glossary, or to parse and extract uh, uh, information from, from requirements. But uh, what uh, we know from this document is that uh, uh, all the requirements in the document are having the, the shall uh, uh, modal verb uh, on it, so we can we can ask the tool. Okay, please pass the document and extract every single sentence, which is uh, which could be uh, having a, a, a shall statement. So I I'm using now the patterns that are in the in the vocabulary extraction uh, set of rules that I was showing you before, and all this was real time. So uh, 100 pages uh, to parse uh, 200 uh, requirements. In, in a couple of seconds. So this is real time. It is pretty quick <clears throat> to have uh, uh, all the document, oh, sorry, all the statements that are contained in a shell. Probably some of these could be that uh, are not requirements. <clears throat> uh, sorry, but it is uh, pretty quick for you now to, to clear out a little bit and just to keep uh, those that are requirements. So this is uh, yet another mechanism to, to deal with uh, unstructured documents that uh, uh, are not following uh, the structure uh, recommended by ECSS. And now the final use case is uh, is uh, addressing uh, 
or it's just to show you uh, the same uh, rat uh, tool that I was showing you before on top of uh, Word, but now it is on top of uh, doors. So this is my doors uh, where I have all the ECSS standards, uh, both the active ones and the, and the superseded ones. So I pick uh, one particular document. Then I just uh, uh, decide to show only requirements. I will focus, of course, on, on requirements. And of course, uh, uh, in the same way as uh, we have implemented a RAT uh, tool for, for Word, we have also implemented a RAT tool for, for uh, uh, DOORS. This menu, authoring, is not a regular menu in DOORS. This is the menu of, uh, that is implemented, is created when you install the RAT plugin, our RAT plugin, so that uh, you can edit uh, from here. Uh, as easy as uh, as right click and edit, or uh, just uh, uh, using the um, uh, using the shortcut from the keyboard. You know, the first time you have to select uh, which uh, uh, set of rules you want to apply, and uh, you can see here similar example as I was opening before uh, with the use of active voice or passive voice, and uh, the issues with the formulation similar to the previous example. So uh, everything that uh, I was showing you uh, on top of doors, uh, sorry, on top of Word, of course, can be done also on top of uh, uh, doors. And uh, that's all for my uh, demo, and that's all for my uh, webinar. Uh, now, Cecilia, uh, you can uh, move forward a little bit. Thank you very much, Jose. Uh, if you have any questions, uh, Jose will answer in a couple of minutes. Uh, if you want to ask anything, you can write down your questions in the chat box and you can address them to the reuse company or to everyone. Uh, meanwhile, I will tell you about our next webinar. It's called EARS Easy Approach to Requirements Syntax, a Practical Approach. System requirements are usually written in unconstrained natural language, which is inherently imprecise and often requirements authors are not trained in how to write requirements. Following the EARS patterns, common problems found in natural language requirements are reduced or even eliminated. This webinar will give an overview of the key concepts of EARS and provide examples of EARS requirements. The practical block will show how the RAT authoring tools has implemented the EARS patterns. The dates for this webinar are the 20th and 22nd of October. Uh, we will also have a webinar in Swedish on how to get started with requirements quality analysis. And the date for this webinar is the 13th of October. And now let's see if we have any questions. Mm -hmm. Um, let's see, can this uh, drafting rules be applied to other industries like automotive? Um, well, uh, all these drafting rules are clearly addressing the, the space industry. Uh, however, um, with the exception of uh, some few rules on, on how to write uh, uh, references to uh, active uh, standards and so on, of course, this is uh, pretty much uh, Specific to this uh, to this uh, uh, type of standards, I do believe that the rest of the recommendations in the drafting rules are, let's say, common sense uh, for writing concise and clear and unambiguous uh, uh, statements. So I do believe that uh, ninety percent of these uh, can be applied uh, uh, to other industries. And also, I do believe that um, uh, for uh, with regards to the patterns we have implemented as well. Um, I don't remember by heart uh, every single uh, type of uh, requirement that was addressed in this taxonomy of types of requirements, but I do believe that, uh, uh, of course, uh, functional requirements, interface requirements, all these types of requirements are also common across uh, different disciplines. So, of course, you can, you can uh, use uh, all this in, in other disciplines. Mm -hmm. Okay. If I am interested in performing a consistency check between the subjects found in a requirement specification and the objects defined in an architectural model in, for instance, a SysML, and look for deviations, what is the simplest way of performing that task? Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, the simplest way is, uh, uh, I didn't mention today, it was not the focus of uh, probably of uh, today's uh, uh, webinar, but uh, KEM can connect in real time to, 
to different types of modeling tools. So we can interface, as I was uh, showing you in, in one of my slides uh, briefly, we can interface uh, KM uh, to different modeling tools. Uh, uh, this is just a short uh, list of the tools, uh, Rhapsody, uh, Cameo, Magic Draw Cameo, uh, Capella, uh, MATLAB Simulink. So when, when you make this interface, uh, this makes possible to have a consistency check and completeness check uh, between the requirements uh, in uh, doors or, or work and uh, the models in, uh, in, um, in uh, the, the, the elements in your model, right? Uh, oof, I, we, we could uh, speak uh, for hours uh, on the topic of uh, consistency, but uh, we have a webinar on this topic. So if you are interested, uh, just uh, send me an email if you want to know more details or just uh, browse our website and uh, look for uh, this uh, webinar that I mentioned. It was uh, probably a couple of years ago as well. A webinar on completeness and another webinar on consistency. So uh, there you will learn uh, more on, on how to uh, implement uh, consistency and completeness rules on RQA. Okay, thank you. Uh, a requirement, even if it doesn't fit all the criteria, can it still be managed in your tool set? Mm, yes, absolutely. So this, uh, um, uh, some of the rules uh, in the in the drafting rules, um, some of these recommendations are just recommendations. So like the example I was mentioning of, of the use of passive voice, it is recommended uh, to use uh, active voice when possible, but it is not uh, forcing you uh, to use uh, always active voice, right? Uh, but in any case, um, even even for those rules that uh, are kind of uh, mandatory rules in the in the in the drafting rules document, uh, with our tool you can uh, you can have uh, the the requirement uh, with the red frame uh, telling you okay you have made this and this and this and this and this mistake, and then you can keep uh, you can keep your requirement uh, in in Word or or doors. Uh, so remember that our tools are not are not requirements management tools. So our tools are on top of. Uh, of, uh, of the uh, requirements repository, so that uh, even if the requirement is, uh, let's say, in red, let's put it in this way, um, you can still uh, click OK, and the requirement will be stored in, in your in your tool. As, as was the example of, of the requirement that I was showing you in, in, in the video, the RDF uh, uh, related um, requirement, before I changed the, the dictionary, this requirement was uh, was not uh, red. I think it was in yellow. Can you lay something wrong? Uh, but I could uh, even uh, save the requirement uh, before I modified uh, the dictionary and came back just to check that it was in green. So uh, in any case, uh, with the RAT tool or with the RQA, you can still manage your requirements even if they are not fully uh, fitting your rules. Okay. Uh, we have no more questions, so thank you very much, everybody, for attending. If you have questions later or want more information about our tools, uh, don't hesitate to contact us by email to contact at reusecompany.com or uh, through our website, uh, reusecompany.com. Reuse thank you very much and goodbye. Thank you. Have a good day.